Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, so much for that introduction, and uh, to Tony Di Domenico and everyone at Ahuri. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today, and I'm very pleased that my uh, my flight arrived early, and I was able to hear the complimentary words of uh, Senator Cameron. Uh, so wonderful that Qantas was running ahead of schedule for me. But uh, look, it is a wonderful occasion uh, whenever uh, you're all gathered here uh, in Canberra, and uh, as I always like to do, this is a wonderful opportunity to fill you in on the government's thinking, uh, not just in the uh, midst of the most recent budget, but uh, also in relation to how we're tracking against some of the things uh, that were announced and have been progressed, uh, admittedly with many uh, of you assisting uh, over the course of the past year in implementing uh, those announcements from uh, last year's budget as well. Now, in, uh, in introduction, uh, I just want to say a few words on the state of the housing market. Uh, no doubt, uh, this is still a very pressing issue for uh, many Australians, perhaps less so uh, than it has been in recent years, but it is an extraordinarily pressing issue. Uh, over time, uh, we know that uh, rental properties have become less affordable for low-income households, uh, and sadly, notwithstanding concerted effort from uh, all states and territories and, of course, the federal government, homelessness numbers uh, have increased. Uh, and even if you own your own home, uh, there's a pretty good chance that you think about your own children uh, or friends' uh, abilities to afford a house uh, or to own your own home or change your own home as your own circumstances change. Just last year, an ANU poll on housing affordability uh, found that around 87% uh, percent of respondents uh, are either very concerned or somewhat concerned that future generations will not be able to, to afford to buy a house. And that obviously has implications for the entire housing spectrum, uh, certainly those at the lower end of the housing spectrum which many of you are focused on. The government uh, acknowledges these challenges and shares in these concerns, and which is why we have made housing affordability a centrepiece of our agenda. And it's hard, and I think this is one area where Senator Cameron and I would agree, or I'd agree with his statements, uh, particularly when he was quoting Sir Robert Menzies, uh, it's hard to uh, overplay the influence of housing in so many aspects of our lives. It directly influences family stability, mental and physical health, education outcomes for children, and of course, employability. From a policy perspective, though, housing affordability is wickedly complex, and there is no single issue that can remedy all of the problems. On complexity, I just want to start with a word on the, the state of the broader housing market. Uh, pleasingly, national dwelling prices have softened in recent months following several years of strong growth, uh, primarily reflecting price declines in Sydney uh, since mid last year and moderating, pro moderating price growth in Melbourne uh, in recent months. Price growth across all of the eight capital cities fell by 0.3% through the year to April 2018, marking it as the first uh, negative growth uh, since 2012. Uh, pleasingly, rental price growth is subdued uh, and rental yields remain low, but stable at 2.9% uh, up to December 2017, which is just under the five-year average of 3.1%. Uh, rental vacancy rates remain stable uh, at around the five-year average. From a supplier perspective, pleasingly, Australia has experienced one of its largest booms in home building in recent years, led by record construction of uh, particularly high-rise developments in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. The pace of dwelling investment has softened in recent quarters with declines in three out of the four past quarters uh, to the December quarter of 2017. But going forward, uh, high levels of work in the pipeline as well as the strength in uh, new approvals are expected to keep dwelling investment elevated, certainly by historical standards. So after peaking and then falling sharply in the second half of 2016, building approvals have picked up uh, and the trend is at their highest level since that time. 
The 2018-19 budget forecasts dwelling investments to uh, forecast those to fall uh, by 3% in 17-18, rising slightly by 1.5% one, uh, one in 18-19, in and then again remaining flat in the following 19-20 year. The total uh, value of housing finance commitments have been trending down, with the composition shifting strongly towards owner-occupiers away from investors. And in trend terms, the value of uh, new investment finance commitments is at its lowest level since April 2016. Uh, APRA, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, has implemented two rounds of macro prudential measures uh, in response to government concerns about investor lending growth and the prevalence of investor only owning uh, in, investor interest only loans uh, and the uh, commensurate declining lending standards. More recently, uh, APRA has announced plans to remove its 10% investor growth benchmark which reflects improvements that authorised deposit-taking institutions have made to lending standards uh, with a lot of encouragement from, AP from APRA. These market movements have occurred uh, with very targeted intervention from APRA without the sledgehammer approach uh, which is proposed by our political opponents with a permanent housing tax. Now, looking at the uh, most recent budget, um, uh, I want to outline as a background the Australian Government's affordable housing supply solutions, uh, the progress uh, we've made uh, to improve housing affordability and the measures announced, some of the more low-key measures announced uh, in the budget a few weeks ago. Um, data improvements, uh, many of you will have noticed, will be achieved with an additional investment of nearly $5 million to the ABS over four years to improve uh, estimates of key housing stocks, the intensity of urban land use and dwelling construction costs. Uh, we believe that this investment will augment the data improvement work that the Commonwealth, states and territories will undertake as part of our new National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, which I'll touch on shortly. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare will also develop a publicly available data dashboard uh, to ensure that researchers and policy makers have easy access to the broad range of housing and homelessness data that they require uh, to develop appropriate strategies to address those. And of course, uh, the government is funding high quality research on housing, homelessness and urban issues by committing uh, $5.5 million over the next three years to fund Ahuri's National Housing Research Program. And since uh, the National Housing Research Program began in 2000, Ahuri has funded more than 250 research projects and published over 700 reports uh, and been a leader in providing a strong evidence base for policy discussion uh, and development. Now, moving on to some of the more substantive issues, uh, any meaningful housing and homelessness policy uh, must address supply uh, and, of course, address the demands on the system as well. The supply of housing options and the ability of Australians to enter the market and reduce demand pressures which do not support, uh, which don't support home ownership uh, are increasing. But as always, the key responsibility of governments at all levels is to, to ensure that there is sufficient housing supply across the entire housing spectrum. Terminology which is well known to you but is finally starting to enter uh, the broader lexicon. From 1 July uh, 2019, the government recently announced we'll be removing tax deductions for expenses associated with holding or land banking vacant land. Uh, this means that taxpayers can only claim deductions for expenses related to holding vacant land to the extent that they're carrying on a business uh, or including a primary production business. This is uh, primarily designed as an in integrity measure uh, to ensure that deductions are not being improperly claimed for expenses such as interests uh, related to holding vacant land where the land's not genuinely uh, held or not genuinely in the short term uh, got a prospect of a development, therefore uh, pumping more supply into the market. As one of the largest landowners in Australia, again this year, the government announced uh, our intention uh, to dispose of surplus Commonwealth land 
and make that available for new housing. Last year, the most notable example of that was uh, our uh, release of the 127 hectare site in Maribyrnong in uh, Melbourne, eight kilometres from the Melbourne CBD. Uh, we've made further announcements this year and in essence, uh, the government's approach is, uh, and we've been very strict with each of our departments, uh, you are not to sit on land that you have no prospect of using. And in the case of uh, the 127 hectare site in Maribyrnong, it hadn't been uh, used for 20 years. There was no prospect of that being required by defence uh, who held it uh, and the, therefore we pushed very hard uh, to ensure that it was released. And that is continuing uh, with a site in Queensland, uh, a, a communication site in Queensland and a range of other sites which will be announced between now and the election. Uh, so the government will continue to identify those sorts of opportunities, uh, particularly uh, in light of the National Housing Finance Investment Corporation, which will commence its activities from 1 July this year, uh, and will seek to work with it uh, in developing those, uh, those parcels of land. Uh, that dovetails nicely into really what was, in many respects, the centrepiece of last year's budget, which was the uh, Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. It will commence uh, very shortly. Uh, this new corporate entity is dedicated to improving housing outcomes uh, for all Australians, including by providing uh, tangible and significant support to community housing providers. The Investment Corporation will house a $1 billion national housing infrastructure facility and partner with eligible recipients to finance critical infrastructure to unlock new uh, housing supply. Uh, the infrastructure facility will use tailored finance of $825 million split between loans and equity and up to $175 million in grants to partner with local governments, registered community housing providers and other eligible applicants to fund new or upgraded infrastructure such as, such as water, uh, transportation, sewerage uh, and electricity, uh, as well as, crucially, uh, for those uh, inner city sites often, uh, site remediation works. We believe this will drive efficiencies and cost savings in the provision of affordable uh, housing, which in our view will always and should always form a part of those developments that have been unlocked by the infrastructure facility. The investment uh, corporation investment mandate requires that the infrastructure facility funding can only be used to finance projects that demonstrate additionality. So in other words, it'll only fund projects that otherwise would not proceed or would proceed at a smaller scale or at a later time without the assistance of uh, the infrastructure facility. It is not there uh, to gold plate uh, existing supply or just to augment and improve returns uh, for developers uh, of supply that was already going to enter the market. This will bring more dwellings to the market ultimately and we don't want it to become a subsidy for uh, what would be described as economically unsustainable development or marginal projects that wouldn't go ahead. The investment corporation will also operate an affordable housing bond aggregator uh, that will, uh, has already been established, which will seek to provide cheaper and longer term finance for community housing providers. Uh, and uh, we were very pleased last year to announce that that would be fully backed by a government guarantee which we know is going to push down uh, those rates much closer to the government bond rate, which is a very important part in addressing the yield gap which we all talk, talk about. It's not the only piece of the picture. It's not going to address the yield gap on its own, but it goes a long way towards doing that. Um, the affordable housing bond aggregator uh, was designed through a lot of work by many of your members uh, and we were very pleased and thankful for the advice uh, and all of the submissions we received. And the design of the aggregator uh, reflects the recommendations uh, of uh, the report uh, and also the Affordable Housing Implement Implementation Task Force. Uh, again, an area where you and your members uh, play a key role uh, in 
uh, ultimately designing government policy. Last year, we also announced um, the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. Uh, this new funding agreement with the states and territories, we believe, is a very important step to delivering improved outcomes across the housing spectrum and improving, importantly, transparency and accountability for the Commonwealth's expenditure on housing and homelessness. Negotiations have been underway since August last year and the agreement is now set to commence from 1 July 2018. Pleasingly, the Northern Territory has already signed up to the multilateral agreement and constructive negotiations are continuing with all states and territories on our bilateral agreements. And I'm urging all the remaining states and territory to get on board. But in the end, the Commonwealth uh, wants to ensure that every dollar of taxpayers' money expended on housing and homelessness, uh, we can point to the benefits and point in a tangible way to the way in which those benefits are met against objective criteria. Uh, under this National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, we expect to provide more than $7 billion over the next five years, including an estimated $620 million to be matched by state and territory governments to fund homelessness support services. Importantly, and from my perspective, I think it's been underreported, for the first time, this funding will be ongoing and indexed, giving certainty to those organisations that we believe have delivered very effective frontline services to the homeless and those at the risk of homelessness. Australia, in our view, has a remarkable history of creating innovative public policy, especially in the realm of social policy. But we recognise there is so much more to do in support of social housing and homelessness. The 2016 COAG report on performance confirmed that three out of the four benchmarks set by the National Affordable Housing Agreement in 2009 had not been achieved, despite the government providing the states with over $9 billion in that seven year period. So the government will require now states to sign a bilateral ag agreement at least every five years to provide a point of review. This will ensure government policies are addressing current and emerging housing and homelessness priorities. Obviously, this makes sense. There's no single static housing market in this country, and the bilateral agreements acknowledge this at a jurisdictional level, while also taking account of priority cohorts and policy areas of national importance. Prescribing conditions in legislation will also secure improved outcomes but in a way that's achievable for states and territories and doesn't jeopardise funding that is used for core social housing and homelessness services. So can I say in relation to uh, the Finance and Investment Corporation, the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, uh, we are very keen to ensure that uh, between both of those sources of quite significant, significant Commonwealth expenditure, we're driving outcomes which support you. We're driving outcomes that support the policy needs that have been described and identified, but doing it in a way uh, that ensures uh, it can be uh, and can meet emerging uh, and different needs in different markets and in different jurisdictions. And that is, in the end, what we think uh, is necessary in this space. As I've emphasised throughout my remarks, and for all of you who have had to sit through other speeches of mine, as I remark in every single one of my speeches, uh, none of these are unconnected issues. These are all ultimately connected in one way or another. We always, and we're always likely, to have a significant role as a federal government in providing social housing and homelessness support for those most in need. However, we also do have a duty to create the right incentives and settings to enable the private market to deliver affordable housing to the rest of the population. Supporting commuting housing providers, which we've placed at the centre of our thinking, to provide affordable housing is a key way to bridge the gap between social housing and the private market. And this is something that government, governments at all levels would do well to focus more on. Uh, and that's why uh, I want to conclude my, my remarks there, because uh, throughout the 18 months or so that I've been uh, working on housing policy, 
it's clear that we, in some respects, uh, are laggards when we look at comparable jurisdictions who funnel institutional investment, uh, who make better use of their community housing providers. And that's why it's probably no surprise to you that so many of the decisions we've taken since then, whether it's the Housing Finance Investment Corporation, the bond aggregator, which put community housing providers at the centre, or whether it's our negotiations on the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, which again try to drive efficiencies through state and territories, potentially through additional use of community housing providers, uh, draws on that view that the Treasurer and I have. And in the end, uh, we can all talk about the yield gap. We've taken concrete steps to try and meet some of that gap. Uh, in the end, we think innovative thinking is going to be, uh, and of course government support, but innovative thinking is going to be the thing that singularly drives uh, bridging that gap and we know that that thinking primarily uh, not just comes from our wonderful researchers and the policy work that is done but on the ground our community housing providers who do uh, such an amazing job and uh, I was uh, in, uh, in Western Sydney um, just a couple of weeks ago launching uh, a new development which just showed that it is not beyond us uh, to, in a very sophisticated and institutional way, uh, funnel large amounts of investment into uh, extraordinary housing outcomes that do provide a decent return, that do bridge that yield gap. And now what we need to do is scale it. So the job of the Commonwealth, as far as I see, is uh, empowering our F National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, which will commence in just a matter of weeks and will very soon announce the composition, uh, the chairman, the board uh, of that organisation, the executive of that organisation uh, who will have responsibility for conducting the activities of the bond aggregator and the infrastructure facility. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very exciting time seeing what they're able to do in trying to uh, bridge that gap and trying to keep government focused at all times on emerging issues in the market and how we can, in the end, get more supply into the market, get more supply at the right price points, because that ultimately is the thing that's going to do the most to address uh, housing and homelessness issues. So can I again uh, thank you all for uh, your work, thank all of your organisations for what you're doing in this space. Uh, it is uh, an extraordinarily large uh, or a very, very big priority for the Treasurer and I, and we really lean on many of you for your thinking and your advocacy and we've been very grateful for that uh, over the last 18 months or so and uh, we hope that that can continue uh, as we look to bed down a number of those key policy achievements uh, over the next 12 months. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do you have time? Thank you. The Minister has kindly agreed to stay on for a few questions. Uh, can we have hands raised for... We have one down, uh, down here at the centre table. While the microphone's coming, Stuart Loomis from BHC. Minister, with the progressive uh, disposal of surplus Commonwealth land, how will that be offered so that community housing providers are able to access it to provide rental accommodation and not forced in a position that they're competing against traditional property, residential property developers to, to gain a foothold? Um, look, it's, we've made very, very clear from uh, the first parcel of land that we released, which was Maribyrnong, and last week, uh, last week a site in, in Queensland, we've made very clear that Yes, the Commonwealth has a disposal policy, and you'd all, as you all expect, the disposal policy um, dictates or prefers that you have you know, open market uh, processes that, in the end, mean you can maximise the value of that, uh, that piece of all that parcel of land. We've taken a different view in relation to uh, any parcel of land that's being released for the purposes of housing, and we've made very, very clear that uh, in each of those cases, uh, we will mandate a requirement uh, or that uh, ensures that affordable housing uh, is a part of the picture, whatever that master plan, whatever that development 
uh, looks like. And when you talk about uh, how we can, in a sense, stack, uh, stack up uh, investment from different levels of government to ensure that, um, that we do encourage uh, affordable housing and that we do meet that gap, well, from our perspective, if it's Commonwealth land, one of the ways we can do that is ensure that it's being offered to the right people at the right price. So uh, in, any case, in any situation where a disposal uh, has a housing-related component to it, uh, where that's been the driver for the disposal, uh, the Treasurer, myself, the Finance Minister uh, are going to be very closely ensuring uh, that it doesn't preclude uh, community housing providers, for example, or others. And indeed, in assessing, and the Finance and Investment Corporation uh, who will have a role into the future. In assessing proposals, uh, whether they be solicited or unsolicited, solicited in the, ex in the example you use, uh, that part of the matrix will include what is the value proposition from an affordable housing perspective. And uh, that will be, uh, I think, an area of great competitive advantage. And I think those in the market will realise that the government has a uh, has a thirst for those sorts of projects, has uh, absolutely wants to encourage uh, an affordable housing component and I suspect it will become uh, part of every proposal that comes to government as so, so far as it involves Commonwealth land because that will be, uh, in our view, um, certainly a step ahead for that particular proposal. Thank you. Time for one more. Over... Uh... Thanks. Hi, Jack Panton from Unison Housing. Thanks for your speech, um, Minister Sucker. Um, Canada announced a $40 billion national housing strategy um, and it's occurred to me listening to you speak that um, you've announced, um, or not announced, but spoken about a number of great initiatives. Um, could you give some um, context around how those are derived um, and whether or not there's any consideration for a national strategy? Well, um I mean, one of the frustrations, uh, I'll be quite frank with you, is the fact that um, whilst, uh, you know, with our, with our federation being what it is, no single level of government controls all the levers to housing related issues. So to be quite frank, it's a frustration in a range of portfolios. And, um, you know, if you, I, I look at counterparts in New Zealand, maybe Canada's reasonably analogous to us, uh, but when you look at uh, the issues we're trying to grapple with. Often, uh, the federal government, we, you know, we have the greatest means in some respects to fund um, particular initiatives, but we often have very little control without the agreement of the relevant state or territory jurisdiction. We have very little control over how that money is spent and how effective it ultimately is. That is the biggest impediment to those kinds of strategies. So. What we did with the Housing and Homelessness Agreement, for example, uh, I thought was reasonably incremental. I mean, we in essence have asked the states uh, to provide us with some better data, uh, to agree on some uh, basic KPIs, uh, and to, in essence, ensure that the money is being acquitted in the way that we've asked for as the funder of that, that money. Now, uh, getting that agreement approved perhaps slightly more difficult than I would have thought, given that I don't really believe that they are unreasonable requests um, when you've got one level of government contributing uh, to another who's got primary responsibility for it. So in the end, within that framework, what we've tried to do is say, OK, well, what are the areas we can control? Now, uh, with the Housing Finance Investment Corporation, with the disposal of Commonwealth land, with the bond aggregator, with the the billion dollar infrastructure facility, we saw those as being areas uh, that are national in their scope, obviously, uh, have not been really conceived by a federal government before. This is the first intervention to that extent that a federal government has done. Uh, and it dovetails most neatly with the responsibilities of states and let's not forget uh, local governments as well. So when you look at our reasonably unusual federation model the responsibilities that sit between three levels of government in relation to housing, uh, we think we've 
uh, found the optimal way of trying to address it. Now, the proof will be in the pudding, uh, but in the end, I think it's going to require the efforts and agreement of the Commonwealth with the states and territories. You all know that's notoriously difficult. Uh, it's even notoriously difficult when the Commonwealth is the majority funder in any particular project. Uh, so uh, I'd say what we've outlined over the last 12 months is a national strategy. It's got to be a national strategy, though, that, is, that takes account of the divergent markets around the country. Uh, as I spoke about in my speech, the, uh, the very different issues uh, that, uh, not just in a geographic sense, but it's not a static market, you know, uh, that arise from time to time. So you need institutions and you need programs that are flexible enough to deal with those. We think uh, that from 1 July, the Housing Finance Investment Corp, the bond aggregator, the infrastructure facility, uh, I think it has enough flexibility that it can work with the states, recognise the role that the states play, recognise the role even that local governments play, uh, and bring some of the financial resources of the federal government to bear. Now, there might be an argument into the future for even more of that. Uh, and if it's very successful, I suspect our federal government will be very keen to do that. Uh, but I think let's see how the bond aggregator goes. Let's see how the Housing Finance Investment Corporation goes. I mean, I would like them, <clears throat> you know, they've got an investment mandate. I would like them to get pretty creative. And, you know, I've said very publicly on many occasions uh, if they're successful in what they're doing, I'm very happy to see Mission Creep there. Uh, and all of a sudden you've got a body, you've got an institution that sits at a federal level that if it pushes the envelope on its own mission, pushes the envelope a bit on what its mandate is, uh, if it's successful, I can't see any federal government standing in their way in doing that. And again, if it's successful, well, um, again, I think I certainly know our government would be very, very happy to look at additional resources for it, provided that it's meeting the ultimate objective, which is to get uh, more affordable housing into the market and more dwellings into the market full stop. Sorry, that's a very long-winded politician's answer, but I, I think you, you understand the very unique issues we face in a policy sense between our various tiers of government. Thank you, Minister. Please join me in thanking Minister Michael Sucker. Thank you. Thank you very much.